The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is a system that gets activated when our blood volume drops and our blood pressure drops. And the whole purpose of it is to increase blood volume, increase blood pressure. So let's have a look and see how this system works. If you have a look, renin angiotensin aldosterone, three different terms and they're released in that particular order. So the first thing we need to talk about itself is renin. Now, if you were to take the kidneys, you should know that the filtration system is called the nephron. And there's about 1 million nephrons per kidney. Now, the majority of the nephron sits in the cortex of the kidney, but the loop of Henle and the uh, collecting ducts sit within the renal pyramids, also known as the medullary pyramids. If we were to take a single nephron out and we were to stick it here, what you'll find is that there's an afferent arteriole, which is blood coming in, and then it turns into a capillary network called the glomerulus, then an efferent arteriole coming out. Now, what you need to be aware of is that your kidneys need to filter about 120 milliliters of blood per minute, or they need to create 120 milliliters of filtrate per minute. That means when this blood comes in, of this blood, it needs to get filtered into this glomerular capsule and 120 milliliters of what's now called filtrate is produced per minute. That means about 180 liters per day of filtrate is produced. However, of that 180 liters that we produce per day, we don't pee out all of that 180 liters, as I'm sure you're aware. We pee out only one percent of that, 1.8 liters. So that means 99% of what we filter at the glomerulus is thrown back into the body, back into the bloodstream. Now this is important because the kidneys is, are basically weighing up exactly what we need, what we don't need, okay? Now, this is why the kidneys must maintain this consistent, what's called glomerular filtration rate of 120 mils per minute. If your blood volume drops, for example, due to a bleed out, so hemorrhage, or due to some sort of uh, peripheral vasodilation, which may happen due to anaphylactic shock, for example, your blood pressure drops and your blood volume drops. Now that means that the kidneys at the glomerulus will not be able to filter that 120 milliliters per minute. And this is a stimulus to release the first component of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system called renin. Now where is renin specifically released from? Well, let's have a look. In the afferent arteriole, the blood coming in, there are some cells in the walls of the afferent arteriole. Now these cells are called juxtaglomerular cells, also known as renin-releasing granular cells. So they're called juxta juxta glomerular cells, also known as granular cells. Granular cells. Now, these are the cells that actually release renin. Now, renin is an enzyme, okay? It's not a hormone, it's an enzyme, and it's released by the granular cells of the afferent arteriole. Okay, now what stimulates its release? I told you a drop in blood volume, drop in blood pressure, but how does it know this? Well, it knows this because as the blood that's coming in, if the blood volume has dropped and therefore blood pressure has dropped, these juxtaglomerular cells or, glomer or granular cells are actually baroreceptors. and they pick up that drop in blood pressure, and then they release renin. So the first way renin is released, first way that renin is released is a drop in blood pressure in afferent arteriole. That's the first way. Now there's another way that renin can be released. Now think about this. If the blood pressure has dropped and the blood volume has dropped, that means the blood's moving through quite slowly with less of a force or push behind it. So it comes through to the glomerulus, gets filtered, and now you've created filtrate here. Now think about it. If the blood pressure is low, blood volume is low, this filtrate's going to move through slowly. Now if it moves through slowly, remember that at the proximal convoluted tubule, this is where we reabsorb approximately 65% of all the stuff that gets thrown back into the body. That includes sodium. 
And then at the loop of Henley, around about 15% is thrown back at the loop of Henley. And the other portion, of the, so the descending and ascending portions of the loop of Henley, and then about 5% is thrown back at the distal convoluted tubule. This is of sodium, okay? Now, if this filtrate is moving through slowly, think about it, there's more time for this salt to be pulled back into the body, which means more sodium gets taken out of the tubules and thrown back into the body, which means by the time we reach the distal convoluted tubule, is there going to be less sodium or more sodium? There's going to be less sodium. This is the next trigger to release renin. But how, if we're in the distal convoluted tubule and these cells are here, well, there's a cell type in the distal convoluted tubule that measure concentration. They're called macular denser cells. Macular denser cells. They measure concentration, so the chemoreceptors. And what they do is there's actually, you can see that the afferent arteriole is, comes into close proximity with the distal convoluted tubule. They're very close together. In actual fact, they're connected by connective tissue. And this allows for a conversation to be had from the distal convoluted tubule to the afferent arteriole, specifically the macular denser cells to the granular cells. And therefore, when these macular denser cells pick up a drop in sodium in the distal convoluted tubule, they tell the granular cells to release renin. So what's the second reason why we re release renin? Is a drop in sodium concentration in the distal convoluted tubule, okay? Now there's a third thing that stimulates the release of renin and it, it is direct innovation from the sympathetic nervous system. That's the fight or flight system. Think about that. In times of fight or flight, we wanna increase our blood pressure. We wanna increase our blood pressure. Why? Because it means our heart can deliver more blood to the muscles so it can fight or run away. And so this is the third reason. Well, the third way in which renin is released, increased sympathetic nervous system innovation. All right, so the first thing you need to know is what triggers the release of renin? Three things. One, a drop in blood pressure, which triggers the granular cells to directly release renin in the afferent arteriole. Two, a drop in sodium concentration in the distal convoluted tubule. This is picked up by the macular denser cells, which then speak to the granular cells to release renin. And three, the sympathetic nervous system directly innovates the granular cells to release renin. So now we've spoken about how renin is released in the first instance. We now need to talk about how the rest are released and how it actually increases blood volume, increases blood pressure. Well, let's move over to this part of the diagram now. Now, what I've just said to you is that renin has been released from the kidneys. Now, renin is released from the kidneys into the systemic circulation. It's floating around. Now, the liver produces and also stores many proteins as well. And usually, if it's something that's stored and inactive, it has the suffix O-G-E-N on the end of it. And what the liver produces and stores is something called angiotensinogen. Again, another protein, angiotensinogen. Angio is referring to blood vessels. Tensin refers to pressure. O-G-E-N tells you it's stored and inactive. And what's gonna happen? Angiotensinogen is released into the bloodstream and comes across renin which I said is an enzyme. What does this enzyme do? Well, renin chops off that O-G-E-N, 
and create something called angiotensin 1. I'm just going to write AT1. Angiotensin 1. What does angiotensin 1 do? Not too much. It is a very slight vasoconstrictor, but clinically doesn't really matter. Angiotensin 1 now is floating around. Now the thing is that angiotensin 1 as it floats around the bloodstream is inevitably going to get to the lungs. Now the lung produces the most amount of an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme. Let's write that down. I'll write it down up here. Angiotensin converting enzyme. A C E ACE. So it produces something called ACE. Now, think about what it does. Angiotensin converting enzyme, it's going to convert angiotensin 1 into something called angiotensin 2. Now, this is what we're interested in angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is what we're interested in. What does it do? couple of things. First thing is that angiotensin 2 is a generalized vasoconstrictor. It's predominantly going to strict, uh, constrict arterioles, which means the blood's going to back up, back up, back up and increase blood pressure. So when you have a generalized vasoconstrictor, what is the ultimate outcome? For a generalized vasoconstrictor, it ends up increasing blood pressure. What's the second thing that angiotensin 2 does? Well, angiotensin 2 also goes to the efferent arteriole. And when it gets to the efferent arteriole, remember arterioles, when you hear the word arteriole, it's a small artery, they have huge amounts of smooth muscle. And so what angiotensin 2 does is it goes to this smooth muscle that's wrapped around the effing arteriole and it tells it to constrict. What does that mean? If these arterioles are constricting, blood is backing up into the glomerulus that increases filtration rate, which is exactly what we wanted because the stimulus was a decreased filtration rate, right? When that decreased filtration rate happened, we had all the sodium get thrown back into the body and the sodium levels were low. That was the trigger. Now we've got negative feedback. We've fixed it up. There's going to be no more trigger there. So the second thing that angiotensin 2 does is it constricts the efferent arteriole. And what's the outcome for constricting the efferent arteriole? Increasing glomerular filtration rate, which also increases the sodium in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, what else does angiotensin 2 do? Angiotensin 2 will also travel, importantly, all the way to the adrenal gland. Specifically, it's going to travel to the cortex of the adrenal gland and stimulate it to release something called aldosterone, the last part of the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system. Aldosterone. Now what does aldosterone do? Aldosterone travels to the distal convoluted tubule and it tells the distal convoluted tubule to take the sodium that's present and throw it back into the body. Now, why would we want that? If our blood volume is low and our blood pressure is low, why would we want to throw more sodium back into the body? Well, remember, wherever sodium goes, water follows. Therefore, sodium back into the body, sodium back into the blood, water back into the blood, increase blood volume. That's the outcome. So number three, aldosterone from adrenal cortex. And what's it do? Increases sodium reabsorption, which ends up increasing blood volume, which ends up increasing blood 
pressure. What's the last thing that I want you to know that aldosterone, uh, uh, angiotensin II does? Well, it travels to the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus is the master regulator of the endocrine system, right? And what that means is it endocrine system, hypothalamus, two pituitary glands, anterior posterior. The posterior pituitary gland has ADH, antidiuretic hormone, diuresis to urinate, antidiuresis to stop urinating. So angiotensin II tells ADH, antidiuretic hormone, to be released into the body, and this will travel to the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts and tell them to reabsorb more water into the body. Reabsorb more water into the body. That's what ADH does. This happens at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. Why more water? Again, more blood volume, more blood pressure. So the last thing I want you to know that angiotensin II does, stimulates the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland. And this resulted in what? Resulted in increased water reabsorption, which increased blood volume, which increased blood pressure. There you go. What was the stimulus? Stimulus was drop in blood volume, drop in blood pressure. What was the outcome when you stimulate renin angiotensin aldosterone system? Increase in blood volume, increase in blood pressure. Hope that makes sense.